everyone and welcome to another episode of Drinking and Reading, Coffee and Weird Tales. Um, this is like the third fucking time I've done this, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna persevere because I really love doing this and I just want to get back into a better frame of mind. So, this is my second cup, mm. and we're gonna try again. <sighs> so. I tried last night to read a different story, but turns out that story was just really fucking depressing, um, and probably not something anybody wants to hear. I, I didn't want to read it, but I did, wish I hadn't, um, but you know, sometimes you just you know, you waste your time needlessly, and that's life. But what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to... One of the other stories that featured in the Twitter and Instagram polls. Um, so the one last night was The Street of Faces. Um, I don't recommend reading it. Um, not for any reason. But the other stories involved in that were something about the undead. I can't remember exactly what that one was. And the other one was Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper by Robert Blotch. And as we all know, I like Robert Blotch. So I think we're just going to go with that one for the time being. And, um, yes, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that and get myself into a better fucking mood. Alright, so, from the July 1943 edition of Weird Tales magazine, The greatest monster of all time still lives. He's here among us, leaving his signature in blood. Yours truly. Jack the Ripper by Robert Blotch. Mm. Fuck. <sighs> All right. Let's begin. I looked at the stage gently. No, mm. <laughs> it just wouldn't be a weird tales reading without me fucking up consistently. Anyway, let's begin. I looked at the stage Englishman. He looked at me. Sir Guy Hollis, I asked. Indeed. Have I the pleasure of addressing John Carmody, the psychiatrist? I nodded. My eyes swept over the figure of my distinguished visitor. Tall, lean, sandy-haired, with the traditional tufted moustache and the tweeds. I suspected a monocle concealed in a vest pocket, and wondered if he'd left his umbrella in the outer office. But more than that, I wondered what the devil had impelled Sir Guy Hollis of the British Embassy to seek out a total stranger here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir Guy didn't help matters any as he sat down. He cleared his throat, glanced around nervously, tapped his pipe against the side of the desk. Then he opened his mouth. What do you think of London? he asked. Why, I'd like to talk about London with you, Mr. Carmody. I need all kinds. So I merely smiled, sat back and gave him his head. Have you ever noticed anything strange about that city, he asked. Well, the fog is famous. Yes, the fog. That's important. It usually provides the perfect setting. The perfect setting for what? Mm. So Guy Hollis gave me an enigmatic grin. Murder. He murmured, murder? Yes. Hasn't it struck you that London, of all cities, has a peculiar affinity for those who commit, um, <laughs> contemplate suicide? No, fuck, homicide. They don't talk that way, except in books. Still, it was an interesting thought. London as an ideal spot for a murder? Why fuck not? As you mentioned, said Sir Guy, there is a natural reason for this. The fog is an ideal background, then. Ideal background. And then, too, the British have a peculiar attitude in such matters. 
You might call it their sporting interest. No, yeah, no, fuck. Their sporting instinct. They regard more... <laughs> They regard murder as a sort of a game. I sat up straight. Here was a theory. Yes, I needn't bore you with homicide statistics. The records are there. Aesthetically, temperamentally, the English gentleman is interested in crimes of violence. A man commits murder. Then the excitement begins. The game starts. Will the criminal out with the police? You can read between the lines in their newspaper stories. Everybody is waiting to see who will score. Yeah, right. British law regards a prisoner as guilty until proven innocent. That's their advantage. But first they must catch their prisoner. And London bobbies are not allowed to carry a firearm. London bobbies are not allowed to carry firearms. That's a point for the fugitive, you see. All part of the rules of the game. Hmm. I wonder what Sir Guy... No, I wondered what Sir Guy was driving at. Either a point or a straitjacket. But I kept my mouth shut and let him continue. The logical result of this British situation... The logical result of this British attitude towards murder is... Sherlock Holmes, he said. Have you ever noticed how popular the theme of murder is in British fiction and drama? I smiled. I was back on familiar ground. <laughs> Angel Street, I suggested. <laughs> Ladies in retirement, he continued, he counted. Night must fall. Payment deferred, I added. Laborium Grove, kind lady, love from a stranger, <sighs> name dropping fuck, portrait of a man with red hair, black, limelight. <laughs> he nodded. <laughs> Think of the motion pictures of Alfred Hitchcock and Emlyn Ward. Ah, oh, buddy! And Emlyn Williams, the actors, Wilfred Lawson and Leslie Banks. Charles Lawton, I continued for him, Edmund Gwen, Razzle Rath... <laughs> Basil Rathburn, Raymond Massey, Sir Cedric Hardwick. You're quite an expert on this sort of thing yourself, he told me. <laughs> Not at all, I smiled. I'm a psychiatrist. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not smug. Then I leaned forward. I didn't change my tone of voice. All I want to know, I said sweetly, is why the hell you came up to my office to discuss murder, murder melodramas with me. <laughs> it stung him. Ooh. He sat back and blinked a little. That isn't my intention, he murmured. No, not at all. I was just advancing a theory. Stalling, I said. Stalling. Come on, Sir Guy. Spit it out. Mm. Yeah, really. Talking like a gangster is all part of the applied psychiatric technique. Is it? Is it really? At least it worked for me. It worked this time. Sir Guy stopped bleating. His eyes narrowed. When he leaned forward again, he meant business. He meant beeswax. Mr. Carmody, he said, have you ever heard of Jack the Ripper? Mm. The murderer, I asked. Exactly. The greatest monster of them all. Worse than Springfield J no, wor mm, mm, no. Worse than Spring Hill Jack or Crispin. Jack the Ripper, Jack the Red. I've heard of him, I said. Do you know his history? I got tough again. Yeah. Listen, Sir Guy, I muttered. I don't think we'll get any place swapping old wives' tales about famous crimes of history. Why is he being such a prick? Another bullseye. He took a deep breath. <sighs> This is no old wives' tale. It's a matter of life or death.
Mm, fuck yeah. Mm, okay. He was so wrapped up in his obsession, he even talked that way. Well, I was willing to listen. Were you, though? We psychiatrists get paid for listening and being fucking smug. Go ahead, I told him. Let's have the story. So Guy lit a cigarette and began to talk. <sighs> London, 1888, he began. Late summer and early fall. <sighs> that was the time. Out of nowhere came the shadowy figure of Jack the Ripper. A stalking shadow with a knife prowling through London's east end, hunting the squalid dives of Whitechapel, Spitalfields. Where he came from, no one knew, but he brought death, death in a knife. Mm. This coffee is going to hurt me later on. I don't care. Fuck. I'm taking on the personality of this fucking comedy guy. I am now a smug fuck. Anyway, six times that knife descended to slash the throats and bodies of London's women, drabs and alley sluts. <laughs> August 7th was the date of the first butchery. They found her body lying there with 39 stab wounds. A ghastly murder. On August 31st, another victim. The press became interested. The slums inhabitants were more deeply interested still. Who was this unknown killer who prowled in their midst and struck at will in the deserted alleyways of Night Town? And what was more important, when would he strike again? Are we going to go? Yeah, okay. September 8th was the date Scotland Yard assigned special duties. Rumours ran rampant. The atrocities just fucking fuck. The atro... The atrocious natures. Fuck. Fuck. Mm. The atrocious nature of the slayings was the subject for shocking speculation. The killer used a knife expertly. He cut throats and removed certain portions of their bodies after death. He chose victims and settings with a fiendish deliberation. Mm. No one saw him or heard him, but watchmen making their grey rounds in the dawn would stumble across the hacked and horrid thing that was the Ripper's handiwork. Who was he? What was he? A mad surgeon, a butcher, an insane scientist, a pathological degenerate escaped from an asylum, a deranged nobleman, a member of the London police. When the poem appeared in the newspapers, the anonymous poem, designed to put a stop to the speculations, oh, then the poem, so fuck, sorry, okay, but which only aroused public interest to a further frenzy, a mocking little stanza. I'm not a butcher, I'm not a kid, not yet a foreign skipper, nor yet a foreign skipper, but I'm your own True loving friend, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. And on September 30th, two more throats were slashed. I interrupted Sir Guy for a moment. Very interesting, I commented. I'm afraid a faint hint of sarcasm crept into my voice. Why? Fuck is this fucking guy's problem? What a twat. He winced, but didn't falter in his narrative. There was silence then in London for a time, silence and a nameless fear. When would Red Jack strike again? They waited through October. Every figment of fog concealed this phantom presence, concealed it well. For nothing was learned of the Ripper's identity or his purpose. The drabs of London shivered in the raw wind of early November, shivered and were thankful for the coming of each morning sun. November 9th. They found her in her room. She lay there very quietly, limbs neatly arranged, and beside her with equal neatness were laid her head and her heart. The Ripper had outdone himself in execution. I'm really not sure that's how it happened, but okay. 
Then panic, but needless panic, for, though press, police, and populace alike, waited in sick dread, Jack the Ripper did not strike again. Months passed, a year. The immediate interest died, but not the memory. They said Jack had skipped to America, that he had committed suicide, they said. They wrote. They've written ever since. Theories, hypotheses, arguments, treaties, but to this day, no one knows who Jack the Ripper was, or why he killed, or why he stopped killing. Mm. So Guy was silent. Obviously, he expected some comment from me. You tell the story well, I remarked, though with a slight emotional bias. I've got all the documents, said Sir Guy Hollis. I've made a collection of existing data and studied it. Fucking well then. Mm. In a couple more minutes. I stood up. Well, I yawned in mock fatigue. I've enjoyed your little bedtime story a great deal, Sir Guy. It was kind of you to abandon your duties at the British Embassy to drop in on a poor psychiatrist and regale him with your anecdotes. Goading him always did the trick on this first time he ever visited me. I suppose you want to know why I'm interested, he snapped. I suppose you want to know why I'm interested, he snapped. Yes, that's exactly what I'd like to know. Why are you interested? Because, said Sir Guy Hollis, I am on the trail of Jack the Ripper now. I think he's here, in Chicago. Ooh. I sat down again. This time, I did a blinking act. What? Oh, no. This time, I did the blinking act. Say that again, I started. Jack the Ripper is alive in Chicago, and I'm out to find him. Wait a minute, I said. Wait a minute. He wasn't smiling. It wasn't a joke. Mm. See here, I said. What was the date of these murders? August to November, 1888. 1888? But if Jack the Ripper was an able-bodied man in 1888, he'd surely be... Dead today. Why, look, man, if he were merely born in that year, he'd be 55 years old today. That's really not that old. Would he? smiled Sir Guy Hollis. Or should I say, would she? Because Jack the Ripper may have been a woman, or any number of things. Mm. Or a cow. Anyway, that's dumb. Sir Guy, I said, you came to the right person when you looked me up. You definitely need the services of a psychiatrist. Perhaps. Tell me, Mr. Comedy, do you think I'm crazy? I looked at him and shrugged. But I had to give him a truthful answer. Frankly, no. Then you might listen to the reasons I believe Jack the Ripper is alive today. I might. I've studied these cases for 30 years, been over the actual ground, talked to officials, talked to friends and acquaintances of the poor drabs who were killed, visited with men and women in the neighbourhood, collected an entire library of material touching on Jack the Ripper, studied all the wild theories or crazy notions. I learned a little, not much, but a little. I won't bore you with my conclusions, but there was another branch of inquiry that yielded more fruitful returns. I have studied unsolved crimes, murders. Mm. I could show you clippings from the papers of half the world's great cities. San Francisco, Shanghai, Calcutta, Omsk, Paris, Berlin, Pretoria, Cairo, Milan, Adelaide. Mm, yeah. The trail is Adelaide, really. Mm. The trail is there, the pattern. Unsolved crimes slash throats of women, with the peculiar disfigurations and removals. Yes, I followed a trail of blood from New York westward across the continent, then to the Pacific. From there to Africa, during the World War of 1914 to 18, it was Europe. After that, South America. And since 1930, the, Ameri the United States again, 87 such murders, 
and to the t trained criminologist all bear the stigma of the Ripper's handiwork. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Um, yeah, okay, this is interesting, actually. I'm enjoying this. Um, uh. Mm, okay, so, what time is it? Oh, uh, actually, okay, yeah. Mm, one moment. Okay. I'm gonna finish reading now. I've really enjoyed reading this. I'm gonna finish my coffee. I have to shower now and go to work. I don't want to, but I'm gonna. Because I don't get paid for doing this, obviously, and I'm gonna make my fucking money somehow. Um, yes, alright. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this first instalment of... Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. I'm enjoying it. Can't wait to see where this one goes. Thanks for watching. See you soon.